The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. The Brexit deadline is imminent and the UK and the European Union are desperately seeking an agreement. But what are the implications either way for the art trade? I'm joined by two experts to discuss where we are with Brexit and how it will affect the art market. And for this episode's Work of the Week, the curator Neville Wakefield tells us about the planks made by John McCracken, who suddenly gained a new audience because he was initially rumoured to be behind that shiny monolith in the Utah desert. Before all that, the holidays are two weeks away, so why not gift a subscription to the art newspaper? You can save up to 40% when you buy a subscription for a friend, colleague or indeed for yourself. Choose between the digital-only subscription, full and immediate access to our website and app, or the complete subscription, all the benefits of the digital-only subscription, plus the monthly printed newspaper, delivered direct to your door. Go to theartnewspaper.com and click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page. Now, despite the coronavirus pandemic, the UK has stuck fast to its intention to strike a trade deal with the European Union by the end of 2020, so talks have intensified over recent weeks, but... At the time of recording, no deal has been struck and the UK and EU remain far apart, according to Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission. The worst case scenario, unless you're a hardline Brexit campaigner, is no deal, and that remains a possibility. But how will the art trade be affected? To try to find out, I asked the writer and art market specialist Ivan McQuiston and former MEP and current chief executive of the British Chamber of Commerce in Brussels, Daniel Dalton. Daniel, before we talk specifically about the art trade and Brexit's effects, uh, let's let, let's get a state of play. Where do you see the negotiations now? Well, I'm actually still pretty positive. I think actually more or less the deal is done. Um, the question now is how that deal is choreographed on both sides uh, of the channel to ensure that politically they can get through on both sides. So I actually think um, the deal was probably more or less agreed at the start of the week. The question now is uh, the UK gave some concessions on Northern Ireland uh, earlier in the week. I think that was the first stage. Uh, The Prime Minister met with Commissioner von der Leyen on Wednesday night. And I think that also was the next stage of uh, of this. I think you will find that the EU will grant some concessions on the level playing field over the weekend and the UK will grant some concessions on fish. And then I think we will more or less have a deal. Um, Certainly that's the feeling that that, uh, we're getting in Brussels. Now, this could all still um, blow up. Um, You know, the politics of this is still very, very uh, delicate. Um, But I think contrary probably to what you you see in in some of the media, I'm pretty confident that we're still on course for a deal um, early next week. What do you make of these contingency announcements from the EU? We're talking on Thursday lunchtime in the UK and this morning the EU have set out some some aspects of sort of contingency planning. I suppose the portents of that suggest that that no deal was more likely, but do you think that's a bit of a smokescreen then? I think the EU is just covering it its back uh, because it did the same thing uh, before March last year when when there was the first deadline. Um, And the EU needs to make sure from its point of view that certain things can continue in the case of no deal. So, for example, uh, airline routes can continue. Some of these sort of things need to be done. So these are more or less the same contingency measures that they put in place um, just over a year ago when we had that first potential um, uh, no deal situation. Um, I do think, though, also that, um, you know, given the fact that this is... um, Going right down to the wire, this puts a little bit more pressure also on the UK to make sure that, um, you know, if there are going to be concessions made, they need to be made uh, very soon. OK. Ivan, what do you think the chief concerns of the art trade are? What what information do they need and what guarantees do they need for this to be something that will stop panic and allow them to continue to trade in the way that they would like to? So I've actually been speaking to people on the ground Um and what we've been getting a lot actually in the art market media is um, a lot of detailed advice from the trade associations and from lawyers and shippers and that sort of thing. What we haven't been getting is what is happening on the ground. How do people feel? So that's what I've been focusing on. Um, and actually, 
the biggest thing is obviously uncertainty. Um, the most interesting thing to me was I couldn't find any panic anywhere. Right. Some people are making air preparations, some aren't. I think it's more varied among the auctioneers. I mean, I've really just done a straw poll. What's really interesting to me, though, is in speaking to the, the trade associations, they had very specific advice about what needs to be done and all that sort of thing, and they were happy to be named. Not one of the dealers or auctioneers I spoke to was happy to go on the record. So that they were happy to talk to me, but they didn't want their names put in. And I think, I, and in certain cases, I now sort of understand why. But I think, generally speaking, it's because they're taking a sort of fairly sanguine approach to this, but they don't want to be seen as unprepared at this stage. I think most of them aren't prepared, and I think they are waiting to see what will happen, and then will react accordingly. Isn't isn't that the chief thing, Daniel? That that. Ultimately, how can you be prepared when you're not sure what the deal is going to be? How can people be advised to respond to a situation about which they are not certain? Well, I think the first thing is um, that things are going to change whether there's a deal or there isn't a deal. Um, And actually, the vast majority of the changes will happen in either case because the UK leaves the the, the single market and the customs union on the 1st of January. Um, So... You know, everyone can prepare themselves for those guaranteed changes. Now, what the deal will do is hopefully smoothen around the edges some of the more challenging elements of that in terms of facilitating uh, uh, easier customs processes or areas like that um, or tariffs, which I I know are not really relevant um, so much in the art market. But in general, they're the areas that the deal is going to cover because, you know, the wider changes that will happen anyway, i.e., You're going to need the customs formalities. You're going to need um, VAT formalities. Um, There are issues over uh, movement of people and and the amount of time you can spend in the EU on work. All of these things are going to happen anyway. So, you know, the advice I would give to people is is get prepared um, for all of those changes, which we know will come into force on the 1st of January, uh, regardless of whether there's a deal. And I think this is one of the the areas about the the way a deal is reported, which is a bit misleading, because I think if we do get a deal, I think everyone will will breathe a sigh of relief, uh, you know, clearly. But then on the other hand, there's a danger that people think that things are going to continue as they are now. And that uh, very clearly isn't the case. Um, Ivan, could you explain why it is that tariffs aren't such an issue in the art world? Because they don't apply to much of what we deal in. I mean, there are a few areas. Everything's really um, defined by customs codings. And the ones that are relevant to the art market really are, without going into too much technical detail, the 9-7 customs coding, sort of 01 to 06. And in that, most of that is zero rated um, for tariffs. There are also um, reduced import VAT for certain things. Um, the sorts of things that, that might attract uh, tariffs are some areas of 20th century decorative arts, the sort of luxury good element within the art market and wine, but, but most of it isn't. I don't think it that, funnily enough, is going to be the big issue. The big issue in the art market is going to be um, the red tape, getting yourself ready for that and getting stuff moved. Um, now, I think, you know, I, I advise a lot of trade associations and I think they've been doing their absolute best to um, get prepared. I remember at this time last year, I was actually doing a special project. Uh, in fact, Daniel was working on it as well um, for La Padra and the BADA in, in the preparation for leaving. And that was really interesting because, you know, bearing in mind that I actually follow this quite a lot, it, it was a sort of um, bureaucratic nightmare just trying to find everything and what you could do. Um, however, they have been, there's some real experts in this, you know, amongst the shippers um, and the, you know, the, the accountants and so forth. So they've just had, for example, the, uh, two or three of the big trade associations have just had a last minute seminar with some very sound advice from those. And speaking to Anthony Brown, for example, who's the chairman of the British Art Market Federation, so the umbrella group for all the trade associations. I had a chat with him a couple of days ago. He says that the work with, they've been working with DCMS now for two years. And he says they, you know, things like export licensing, CITES, VAT, it's all been very thoroughly covered. Um, but of course, he says, um, you know, the technical arrangements may be all in place, but because we don't know what's really going to happen on the ground yet, he says he's calling it so that's the imponderable. And I think that's the issue, really. But having said that, there are all sorts of things that people can do to get ready because um, 
they will have to go through uh, really generally speaking through customs agents through shippers that sort of thing they're going to need what's called an EORI number which they should already have um, as I said I don't want to get too technical because we could go on forever but that's an economic operators registration and ID number and you're going to need that um, and generally speaking you're going to have to operate through what they call chief which is the customs handling of import and export freight and that that really means that for the most part anyone who's sort of importing or exporting to a reasonable degree is probably going to be needing a, a, a shipper or some sort of agent i think it's a different story for you know smaller things but generally that's what we're talking about i mean this is this is where the we start to see this widening gap between the rhetoric around Brexit and the reality of Brexit, right? Daniel, I mean, so much of the the language around Brexit was about deregulation, cutting red tape. It was Boris Johnson's chief project as, as an as a EU correspondent for the D Daily Telegraph to bang on endlessly about EU uh, regulation and red tape. And yet here we are talking about the increased red tape as a result of Brexit. I mean, tell me what you think about that, because isn't that the great illusion of Brexit? Well, I, I speak as a Remainer in this debate. I was on the Remain side, so I'm not necessarily going to try and justify the reasons why the Brexit campaign did what it is. But I think the 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 genesis of the Brexit ideology, if you like, did come from sort of free trade in classical liberal conservatives. They're, but they were always a relatively small proportion, not only the Conservative Party, but of the population as a whole. Um, and I think that was the genesis. But of course, the to win the Brexit vote, um, that alone sort of wasn't enough. And there needed to be a broader coalition. Uh, and there were issues that, that aligned with that, you know, things like immigration uh, issues in, uh, in terms of with the EU and, um, you know, generally the sort of vision that, well, you know, if, if, if we control our own uh, laws, then in some ways, you know, that 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 sovereignty type of issue, which is a much more sort of um, national agenda type of issue, took over. So I do think genuinely that the, the, the genesis of Brexit probably came from a, from a genuine place in believing that, that you could reduce uh, red tape and, and, and free trade and everything. But the reality of it is we're leaving the customs union in the single market. And that actually hugely um, uh, increases the role of government uh, in people's lives, because you know anyone that travels just normally across uh, between uh, the UK and Europe will know that you you'll probably get checked for the cigarettes that you've got but anything else you can take more or less free as long as you're not doing it on a commercial basis now that's going to change for everyone and there's going to be significant checks on everyone for everything so there is a huge as you allude to there is a huge change uh, and it's not necessarily a free marketing uh, type of change in 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 what we're going to have uh, going forward and um that unfortunately is what Brexit means. Now, the reality is it's not a, um, I think many people didn't vote for Brexit on economic uh, reasons. I think it's politics that define this, the issue of sovereignty in particular. Um, uh, and there is some, you know, uh, sort of vision that the UK could be uh, more of a free trading uh, nation globally. And so, in fact, in the art market, there is some, um, some evidence to suggest that the UK might find itself in a slightly more attractive position uh, than the EU, particularly with regards to the new rules on on, on the import of cultural goods uh, in the U in the EU. So there are, in some areas, going to be some advantages from an economic perspective. But the overall, you know, I, from my perspective, is relatively clear that this is going to be uh, more restrictive. Ivan, do you want to explain some of the advantages that the UK might gain in the future, but, but also, importantly, that it already had when it was part of the EU? Well, I think the obvious one, actually, would say gain, it's probably a, a loss, but it's, it was a, decline, a declining advantage anyway. And this is to do with the um, advantageous rate of import VAT we had. And to put that, rather than talk about facts and figures, it's just just give you an example. So... If you had our our our, marginal, our rate was uh, five percent, which was the lowest uh, in the among EU member states for quite a while, and that meant that if you were let's just say um, somebody in Spain and you were buying a, a work of art in New York, it would pay you to actually import it into the EU via London, because that would be where you would pay a much lower import rate of VAT. Spain's was very high. And then, of course, having got it w within to the EU, it could then be exported to Spain. But, of course, you're not crossing that border. Now, obviously, with the UK leaving the EU and it being outside, it can no longer take 
part of that advantage. And what that may mean in practical terms is that the art agents whose businesses were based around that sort of transaction, who were been in London, are, if they're going to carry on in that way, probably going to be moving to either Paris or Brussels, who's, who've gradually brought down their rates over the last three or four years. In fact, there isn't really much of an advantage with the UK now. But it's certainly, it's certainly something that we could lose, well, are, are going to lose as far as that side is concerned. I'm not sure how much that's worth. Um, and it's, you know, it's not necessarily a major part of the um, art markets business in this country, but it certainly was you know, something that was there. I mean, I think one of the things where people don't need to panic is that, of course, the biggest art market in the world is New York. We're already dealing with that on third country terms. So that will continue as is. And anyone who I would suggest that, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a major player in the art market, so a big auction house or a big dealer, you're probably set up already. And you've probably got the resources in-house because you're already doing that across the world. And what you're really going to have to do is to shift the EU from its special status that it now has into that third country status that we that you have with everyone else. So I, frankly, I'm not too worried about people like that. Um, and I, I was more worried really about the smaller dealers and the smaller auction houses. But having spoken to some of them this week, I'm, I'm, I'm getting different reactions. So for example, some of the auction houses have just said, well, you know, we're just going to wait and see what happens because um, when it comes to it, our sellers just don't want to know because they're not going to have to deal with it as far as they're concerned. And the buyers think, well, you know, once I've got it sorted out, they, they will deal with it. In one case, for example, is uh, where I think somebody has made rather better preparations. It's an auction house. They're actually taking on a specialist in shipping to handle all the shipping. And in fact, funnily enough, they're not doing it just because of Brexit, but they are doing from that. And although it's a significant cost, they also see it as, a, you know, something as a sales point, you know, a good way of breeding confidence in their service, which will help them attract new consignments and also reassure buyers. So... Um, I, I don't really want to second guess what's going to happen too much because I think that if we if we all panic too much, that can you know breed disappointment and uh, defeatism. Um, but I also don't want to sort of sound as though it's you know all going to be uh, a bed of roses because it clearly isn't. Right, Daniel, you talked about freedom of movement earlier on. So many you know, in visual arts and beyond in the arts so many organizations rely upon freedom of movement rely upon an international program that requires easy access to performers artists from overseas do you are you concerned about what will happen in in the event of firstly in the event of a no deal and even within the parameters of a a a, a deal that can be struck at this point yeah, I think this is it, this is an area where there would be some concern. And I, I'm not convinced this would be any different if there was a deal or there wasn't a deal, because ultimately the UK is out of the single market. So therefore not not part of the free movement zone. Um, it's unlikely in the deal, but not completely impossible. But I think very unlikely that there are any special concessions for the UK in terms of uh, the amount of days British citizens can spend working in the EU or visas specifically for British citizens, simply because the Schengen zone operates a effectively one size fits all policy and then individual member states um, decide themselves within that set policy. So I think it's very unlikely that anything like that is in the deal if there if there is a deal. Um, and that means there's a significant challenge because from the EU side, it's more restrictive uh, than it is in the UK. So so normally uh, EU citizens will be able to come to the UK, for example, uh, I believe it's for up to six months. And there it's relatively flexible in terms of coming to perform or coming to do a one off event or a little bit of work or repairs or maintenance and these sort of things. Now, from the EU side, it's more restrictive because it's 90 days in a 180 day period. Um, and um, it's more restrictive in general on the amount of on, on what work you can do. So you can tend to go for business meetings. But if you're going for a specific event that you're going to get paid for uh, by that, uh, by an EU entity, um, that becomes much more restrictive. And then you probably are going to need some sort of work permit uh, for it. And it's not clear at this stage uh, how easy they're going to be for performers, for example. Um, it's one of the big worries that we've had over the last two or three years of this, and it hasn't yet been addressed. Um, 
I would hope that even if this isn't included in the deal, um, that over the next six months to to a year, the EU and the UK try to work on some of these issues that are that are practical problems in terms of uh, trading, and 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 we might see some movement from there over the over the years to come. But I think immediately, right now, I would be somewhat concerned about the, their situation. We'll be back with Ivan and Daniel in a moment, but first, here are some of the top stories on the Art Newspaper's website this week. As part of a civil forfeiture suit against Jeffrey Epstein, Sotheby's and Christie's were last week ordered by prosecutors in the US Virgin Islands to disclose all correspondence and dealings with the late convicted paedophile going back more than 20 years, Annie Shaw writes. Denise N. George, the Attorney General of the US Virgin Islands, alleges Epstein misled government officials to secure lucrative tax breaks for his businesses while engaging in sex trafficking and the abuse of underage girls. In court documents filed on the 2nd of December, Christie's and Sotheby's were asked to release all documents documents reflecting or relating to inquiries, sales, bids, communications with or about Jeffrey E. Epstein, any financial information relating to those inquiries, sales or bids, and all documents reflecting or relating to the tax treatment or transfers to other entities for artwork or other objects by Epstein or his agents, including the executors of his estate. A fourth request has been heavily redacted. The auction houses declined to comment. Take Britain is expected to permanently close its restaurant because of racist imagery within the mural decorating it. Rex Whistler's work, The Expedition in Pursuit of Rare Meats, painted specifically for the restaurant in 1927, includes two bound black children who are probably enslaved and depicts crudely caricatured Chinese people. The figures in the huge mural are small, so it's thought that few diners would have been aware of them. Martin Bailey writes that Moya Green, until last month a Tate trustee and chair of its ethics committee, told fellow trustees that committee members were unequivocal in their view that the imagery of the work is offensive, a fact compounded by the use of the room as a restaurant. And finally, the 18th century organ in Notre Dame in Paris, known as the Voice of the Cathedral, has been removed for restoration following the fire in April 2019. Although the symphonic organ was barely scathed by the flames and the gallons of water used by firemen to extinguish the fire, it was laden with lead dust. It needs to be thoroughly cleaned and restored, a process that cannot take place on site. It's expected to take six months, but the organ won't be heard until April 2024, the intended reopening date of Notre Dame, five years on from the fire. You can read these stories and more at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS, which you can get from the App Store. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. As art lovers increasingly look to browse and purchase online, Christie's continues to innovate with its auction calendar. Join Christie's London online or in person this December for Classic Week, a series celebrating art from antiquity to the 20th century. Bid now in online sales including Quentin Blake, 200 drawings and Old Master paintings and sculpture. And tune in on the 15th of December for the live-streamed Old Master's evening sale. Auction highlights include a monumental Daheem still life of a banquet, exceptional panoramic view paintings of Venice and Messina by Van Vitelli, and a rare cabinet picture of cattle by Paulus Potter, arguably the finest painting by the artist still in private hands. The refreshed schedule complements Christie's private sales. Bid and buy art at any time and from anywhere. Find out more on christies.com. Welcome back. Before we go on, do make sure you catch up with the new series of our other podcast, A Brush With, in which I have in-depth conversations with artists about their influences and cultural experiences. The latest episode of this second series, A Brush With Christina Qualls, is out now. Subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you're currently listening. Now, back to Brexit with Daniel Dalton and Ivan McQuiston. Let's talk about the um, cultural property laws. Now, you were involved, Daniel, in in that process as an MEP. Can you say something about what recent changes there have been and what are the implications for the UK in terms of leaving the EU? Will it adopt those rules in the new arrangement or will it diverge? Well, this is one of those interesting ones because it comes into force this month, um, so uh, the UK is um, is not going to enforce it. Um, that's certainly the understanding I have um, from from the government. Um, but of course, the the EU will. Now, this is a, a, a regulation that comes into force gradually over the next five years. It will be twenty twenty five before it's fully uh, enforced, and and that basically imposes an import requirement um, on uh, what the EU defines as antiquities. 
uh, which effectively are um, anything that's over 250 years old or anything that's over uh, 18,000 euros in price if it's over 200 years old. And they will need an import license um, to import that into the EU. Um, and that license will also need to include the provenance and, 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 and proof that it has been exported from the source country, the original source country, uh, legally. Um, that's basically the essence of the changes. Um, it means that we're in a situation where from the 1st of January, the UK won't have any uh, import um, sort of licensing requirements, but the EU will have quite stringent ones. So I think there is some, you know, there's some challenges for those uh, when you need to get into the, import something into the EU. But I think also there are some advantages for third countries that might be moving um, goods into the UK uh, because the UK will be able to issue uh, licenses for export, which which double up as import licenses uh, to the EU. So I think there's an advantage for the UK there. But in general, there are significant changes uh, if, you, if you're going to be importing uh, into the EU. And Ivan, you, you've been talking to people on the ground and no doubt been talking at length to them about this very issue. What, what, what are the dealers, what are the auction houses saying? Well, yes, I mean, it, it's actually particularly significant to me because I do, I specialise, amongst other things, in advising the antiquities trade. And in fact, that's how I first met Daniel, because he was the rapporteur as an MEP guiding this legislation through um, Brussels. Um, my view is, uh, we're not, and it's not just this, we've obviously got the um, fifth anti-money laundering directive that's coming through as well. I don't think it matters whether you're in the UK or the EU. We, if you want to trade with the EU, you're going to have to follow those regulations. It's as simple as that. The anti-money laundering directive, which arises um, from a European harmonisation directive, um, is, is actually, the, the UK is ahead in that. Um, that. That is going to be, well, it is, is law already. Um, and I'm also involved in advising on that at the moment. Um, I think that's actually probably going to be a bigger change. I think if if you're going to try and uh, under the new regulations, if you're going to try and import antiquities into the EU, and you've got to have um, a, a valid export license, be able to show a valid export license showing something coming from its source country. There are all sorts of reasons why that's just not going to work because in most cases, things came out hundreds of years ago. Those licenses don't exist or, or never did, and there's never been any requirement to keep them once you did. So there's going to be all sorts of issues there. I think. And I also think it's not just a UK thing. If you're if you're operating out of the United States and want to do business with the EU, you're going to have to do that as well. So that in itself is not really what I call a Brexit issue, but it is illustrative of the increasing amount of legislation that's going to be uh, the art market is facing. I think, as I said, I think the I think the um, money laundering one is the big one because that really will change the art market. Yes, tell us about the money laundering legislation, because that's already having ripples, right? No, absolutely. I think the big change is that, is that uh, we're always, within the art market, uh, told that we are the last great unregulated market in the world. Well, we are heavily regulated, but we're not directly regulated in the way that some other markets are. But arguably, this will change with the anti-money laundering directive, because there will be an independent regulator in, in, the, in the form of customs hmrc um there are all sorts of uh talks and advice going on at the moment because of course uh this is really uh, supposed to be bringing us in line with other industries like finance you know banking insurance the law all that sort of thing but as hmrc are finding out and have admitted to me uh the art market is a very different fish because it's so much more difficult to pin down. It's much more complicated. You're not dealing with, say, a single linear product or anything like that. It's, you know, I always bring it back to this idea. If you can't define art, you can't define art, the art market. And in fact, uh, the only way you can really attempt to define it is using customs codes. And the customs codes are in the process of review, which is, I think, going to be completed in the next couple of years. And one of the areas that they're specifically reviewing is the definition of antiquities under the coding, because it's not clear. It spreads across more than one coding, and the codes that within which it appears also include other things like botanical and mineralogical um, objects. So I think this is all, all the negotiations are still going on here. It's really about how practical the application of the law will be, because at the moment, if you are going to give people an obligation to declare information, they have to have access to that information. And if they don't, they can't do that. That's probably the area that's being 
um, debated the most what we call an AMP, an art market participant, and who's going to have to respons responsibility within a deal, which could involve, I don't know, three or four stages across maybe eight people. Not everyone involved in that is going to have access to all the information involving all the people in it. And that's that's the sort of area that's being tackled now. I, I, I've got pretty good hopes that this is going to be sorted out because um, I think HMRC have really started to get to grips with this and they they clearly want it to work. I think the difficulty that we have is that they are going to be the regulators. They're the ones who are going to be having to enforce it. But the people who, the department that is actually overseeing, making sure that and ordering it to be done is the Treasury, which doesn't have any responsibility for this. So I think, you know, it, it, it's, that's how the land lies, really. But I think it will be sorted out. Um, Daniel, I wanted to ask you a bit about, you know, you, you were an MEP after the Brexit vote and you were involved in negotiation between Brexit Britain, for want of a better word, and the EU. And, I, you know, there is a perception, you've talked about the, the, the way that the um, discussions between the EU and the UK are presented in the press. There's a perception that this is a, that, that discussions are incredibly hard line and fractious and difficult. But when you were, for instance, involved in these discussions around uh, cultural property, did you still sense that there was there there were areas of cooperation that there was there was a fundamental commitment on both parties to to collaborate? And and can you explain something about about in a way what it's like to be to have been an MEP after that f famous vote in 2016? Yeah, I mean, I was an MEP. I came in uh, only about a year before the vote as well. So my entire time as an MEP was sort of dominated by by Brexit discussions one way or another, because we had, of course, the, the negotiation prior to the prior to the referendum. Um, to be honest, it was a bit of a two two sort of uh, face thing, if you like. On one hand, we were, you know, directly part of the EU and the negotiating process for all the EU internal law, simply because we had a vote. You know, you still have British MEPs that were the often the, the balance uh, and our votes were needed to, to get EU legislation over the line. So we were, you know, many of us were still fully involved in all of that legislation, like the, the, the one you you highlight. Um, and then on the other hand, of course, there was the this ongoing Brexit negotiations, which I think the difficulty with them is from the word go, they've been seen in the media uh, as a zero sum game, i.e., you know, the UK gives something up or, 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 or Brussels moves. You know, if, if, if Britain gains something, the EU loses. If the EU loses, gains something, the UK loses. And it's never been like that. I mean, that's really not the nature of the, the negotiations. And the other difficulty is I think the EU, you know, interest on this from the word go has been how does the EU keep itself together after Brexit? I.e. if the UK goes um, and gets a very good deal and, and prospers massively outside of the EU, then... Uh, some other European member states are likely to think, well, maybe this is a, a good option for us as well. So the EU sort of from the word go had made it very clear that um, it didn't want a situation where the UK was benefiting from 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 Brexit or that the EU wasn't allowing the UK to benefit from Brexit. So as a result of that position, the EU position looks pretty hard and tough. Uh, and I think that actually has been why it's taken so long to get even to the point we are now where we're, we're hopefully getting close to that final deal because, um, you know, the, the EU position has been very uncompromising. And, and that is how negotiations have always worked uh, within the, the European sort of uh, framework. When I was a rapporteur on these, these dossiers, that's exactly how it worked. Both sides would, would stick to their red lines really until the last possible moment when the political heavyweights would come in which would be the rapporteur or the or the um, or the commissioners uh, to check the technical work that their team has done and to sign off on it or make the political concessions necessary to get the deal over the line, and I think this is exactly what you're seeing hopefully here. Right. Okay. I mean, it's it, you know again from 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 the point of view of, of of somebody who's just been observing it, it seems to me that it you know the, again the the rhetoric around it. Oh, it's going to be the easiest deal in history. Um, you know, we hold all the cards, all those kind of cliches that emerged from Brexit. It was it was obvious that the EU was going to play a hard line. Right. I mean, as you as you rightly point out, this is a this, you know, if, if the UK was to get an exceptional deal and prosper wildly in the post Brexit era, it's bad news for the EU. So why would the easy EU make it the easiest deal deal in history? It, this was an, an inevitability if the if 
if the UK came in with such red lines itself into a, an already, a situation in which the EU already had red lines, right? Yes, I think there was a hope at the start that um, both sides would sit down and say, OK, what's in both of our mutual interests to, 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 to have a relationship going forward? The problem was, and I think this is more on the on the British side, is the referendum debate has never ended. You know, the battle, we're still fighting uh, about whether Brexit, you know, is a good thing or a bad thing. Whereas realistically, the country in terms of our country should have probably said, look, you know, if we all get together after the referendum, we may well be able to find a position that not only is beneficial for the UK, but also beneficial for the EU. Because that's not happened in the UK, the EU was like, OK, we need to be strong on our position and we're going to hold hold strong on it. But there are quite a few areas where I think the EU is, uh, and I say this again, as someone that, that was on the Remain side, that the EU is being unreasonable in its negotiating position. For example, saying that the UK needs to align its laws to future EU laws. Whatever those EU laws might be, the UK will be obliged to follow them. I mean, you know, regardless of all of the sort of, you know, uh, Brexit issues, that's not really a viable position for one sovereign entity to take against another. And I, and I think... I think we'll see the EU drop that at the end of the 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 the, the day, but I I do think that's also led to it as the EU has decided to take an uncompromising position, and the UK has not. Um, we still haven't actually got over the the, the referendum. We're still fighting the referendum uh, battles and trade deals in general, and and trade in general. As anyone who's been involved in trade knows, it's difficult. You know, and, and these are tough things, trade, because there are lots of things at play. You know, there are national interests at play. There are also just simply the the day to day feelings of customs officers and how they're going to deal, you know, with you on a particular day. Um, so, you know, these things are difficult. Um, and I, I, you know, some of us were warning before the referendum that this would be difficult. Um, but we are where we are. OK. Lastly, Ivan, I just wanted to get your perspective again, you know, in, in your conversations with people on the ground, um, that battle, ha you know, I know from conversations within the art world that that battle is still going there. And the, to be fair, the, the vast majority of people that I know in the art world are profoundly anti Brexit. Is, is there anyone that you've spoken to who's, who is broadly optimistic about the future post Brexit? And uh, or, or is everybody in a sort of state of flux and we'll see what happens? No, no, there there are. I mean, I was talking to Daniel some, uh, a, a little while ago and I, I think that the thing for me is we, we need to get over the politics so that we can get on with the economics. And this is the real thing here. Um, and yes, I understand all the emotions on both sides of the debate. And I totally agree with Daniel that, that w w whatever else may or may not have happened, the EU was going to have to fight a hard war because in the end they have to go and sell it domestically, politically to their own people. And he's quite right. If if if, we're, if we've been seen to be given an easy ride, you know, that's going to encourage other people. But I think at the same time, um, once this has been done, once we've got beyond the transitional period and assuming the EU is satisfied with the level of difficulty that it's given us and that can sell it, I think... At that, at some point, then, I just my feeling is that then they will they will turn to the economics and say, well, we all now do need need a deal, and we will make that. And and to give you an example, actually, you know, I'm sure some people are, are, are you know, not going to be happy about it and all the rest of it. But in fact, uh, Christopher Bascom, who's the um, director general of the Society of London Art Dealers, um, so they represent most of the. Sort of their, their members make up a lot of sort of big art dealers in, in Mayfair. So he's obviously said that, you know, that temporarily it's the possible disruption after December 31st. But he also said that he was confident that the UK art trade would come through all of it um, without too much damage. Um, it's really the short term period of, of disruption and confusion. And I think that's it. I, the other thing I think that we, we, we haven't touched on at all is that all of these people in the market, just as we are ourselves, are facing this after having probably had the most extraordinary year of their lives. And it's very interesting to see what's happened in the art market in general through the pandemic, because, of course, everyone thought business was going to be terribly badly disrupted. 
and that was going to close down. And I think particularly for dealers it was, although some of them recovered. But I can tell you, you know, for the auction houses, some of them have made more money than they've ever made before as everything is transferred online. And I think this has implications for live events because everyone assumes that everything is just going to go back to normal and they're going to rec uh, recover as they were. I'm not as sanguine about that. But I do think, bearing in mind freedom of movement and all the other things, we do need to be thinking about what's going to happen to all those events, you know, the big fairs that people come over here for and that we go over to places like Tefaf for. Yeah. Are those events actually going to continue as they were anyway, regardless of Brexit? And if they do, it's, it's all about confidence. And will people want to come to London still? Well, I think they will for certain things because it's a nice place to come. They can have a bit, you know, a bit of a laugh and dinner and all the rest of it. And there is a, what, what we have here, actually, is probably the best um, collection of expertise, I would say, within the art market. And so I think there are all sorts of reasons why people would want to come. But I think there are reasons now, well beyond Brexit itself and that issue, that might challenge all that. Well, it's all huge food for thought. Daniel and Ivan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much. You can keep up to date on Brexit and read Ivan's views at theartnewspaper.com. Now it's time for Work of the Week. When the first in a series of shiny metal monoliths found in various locations across the world appeared in the Utah desert last month, there was initial speculation that it might be one of the late American artist John McCracken's planks. It's been quickly dismissed by the various galleries that represent his estate, and so, rather than add to the speculation about who did create the monoliths, we thought we'd focus on McCracken's planks and what makes them so powerful and alluring to collectors, museums and art lovers. I spoke to the curator Neville Wakefield about McCracken and this remarkable series of shiny sculptures. To see images of the planks, go to theartnewspaper.com, click on the podcast tab and look for this episode. Neville, before we talk about McCracken's planks in general, do you have any views on whether you think it's possible that the monolith in the Utah desert was by John McCracken? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, we all, we all like to think that it is. Um, it's it, it, it's a it's as good a thought that it's it's a it's a McCracken plank as it is a alien, you know, landing. <laughs> you know, and there were some indications from from Sverner Gallery that that it, that it could be, but but the reality is that there were, there were rivets on it, and from my understanding of McCracken planks, rivet, rivets would be a major anathema. So, um, sadly, I don't think it is McCracken. I think that's it, the romance of this idea that he, and especially this sort of tantalising detail that his son said he'd, he'd discussed depositing um, sculptures and in, in places where nobody knew they were, you know. Right, and we, we, we all like that idea. It's, it's, it's a little bit like the, the Ed Rocher rock. Um, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed famously simulated a rock that he then took um, and planted somewhere in the... Uh, in the in the high desert, whether that actually happened, we don't know. But but Pierre Bismuth made made a made a film um, called I think Where's Rocky Two or something like that, uh, <laughs> where he he's kind of followed the mythology. He 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 got a detective to try and find you know out whether because of course Ed was very um, typically elusive about whether that had actually happened or whether it actually existed. And and and, and Pierre, you know, sleuthed his way. Um, towards this idea of the mythological rock. So the so-called McCracken plank has all that romantic mythology attached to it. Um, <laughs> and strange things do indeed happen in the desert. There's a bumper sticker that I really like that I remember seeing um, when I first got here that reads, UFOs are not uncommon in Utah. <laughs> oh, well. Um, I mean, and, and also it, it isn't outlandish to connect... McCracken with sci-fi and aliens and everything else is it he 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 had a uh, strong conviction in the existence of extraterrestrial beings and in time travel and all sorts of things he was a sci-fi guy yeah he wasn't he wasn't scared of the idea of extraterrestrial intelligence um or UFOs or parallel universes or any of these things that I think you know in some ways animate 
animate the objects. You know, r- remember he he he's coming. You know, he he's he's sort of running parallel um, with minimalism and and with like the 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 whole idea of excluding content. And so here you have this guy in 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 the American West who's who's creating these objects that that are in a way uh, you know vehicles for content. And so much content. I mean, I love this idea that he had that they were sort of doorways. He said they're not planks, they're not doors, they're doorways. They're, they're, in a sense, he thought of them as portals, and that was this sort of strange experience that we have all, all have in front of them where our presence is reflected in them, and yet we sort of feel like we've been transported somewhere else, right? Yeah, I think the idea of a portal was important to him. And and I think, you know, he's also interested in this idea of abduction. And in, in a way, I think, I think the experience that, 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 that I like to think of in front of them is, is that somehow you do get abducted into these objects. That's their transportative quality. Um, they're not just, they're not just beacons, um, you know, as it like, like the big array or one of these kind of scientific sculptural listening devices but they're actually um they're actually embodiments of 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 some intelligence yeah and i I mean his his obsession with flight and transporting and um you know he could fly an airplane for instance i mean he and also this wonderful fact that he had a studio in a former aircraft control tower i love that detail about his <laughs> his life he's, he's, he seems he's sort of constantly thinking about life beyond our sort of mortal space in a way i only i interviewed him once and and and, and there he's he you know i i think his his interest was in not just the the extraterrestrial in the sense of the more extraordinary part or the more speculative part, um, which is normally talked about in terms of aliens, but 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 also in in, in the sense of, of of just the non earthbound object, and I feel I, I think the, the the planks have that quality. They have the quality of of of, of coming from somewhere else, of 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 being being created in these sort of conditions that, that aren't bound by perhaps gravity, aren't bound by more sort of earthly conditions, which is why, you know, why, why it doesn't seem completely unstrange that they should appear in these strange places, such as the one that appeared in Utah. Yeah. I mean, he went to terrific lengths to create those surfaces, didn't he? And, they, and, and you know, one of the things about it's important to stress with McCracken is that he, it's different from Donald Judd, for instance, in the sense that these aren't made by other people in the same way that he, he, he went to terrific length to make them himself. And you have these what there's wonderful images of how of him making and pouring the, the, the materials and stuff like that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's very different from from the, the, the kind of ready made machine finish of, say, a Judd anodized aluminum plate, which which at, at, at first glance might appear to be very similar. But but yeah, these 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 are these are hand finished works, and and that was really important to him. And a lot of it came from car culture, um, Southern California, the fetish finish thing, um, and you know this this idea of surfaces built up from usually typically wood and then bondo and then and then and then sanded. And 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 he the one thing that he did talk a lot about was the amount of touch um, that it took to create these things because. You know, they did go through all these grades of sandpaper to get to, you know, the final wet and dry 300 or whatever he was using. You know, they, they, they are products of the human hand. And I think I think that was as well as the human mind. And that was very important to him. Yeah. And then there's also this idea that, you know, because they are his most famous body of work. He created all sorts of other bodies of work, for instance, the columns, which are also wonderful things. But in a way there's an element of frustration in the way that he talks about the planks in the sense that he just felt he just couldn't leave them alone he couldn't just bring <laughs> that series to an end did, did you sense that when you talked to him about it yeah i mean i think i think i think they're the sort of light motif the thing yeah, i mean we 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 all have these sort of you know ocd almost ticks that we have to go back and check that they're still there that they haven't changed that they haven't been transformed that they haven't been abducted they haven't slipped into some parallel universe and all these things all these thoughts were i think quite real to john and 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 it did feel like something that he couldn't quite let go of um and and as you say you know he experimented with 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 
lots of different forms within within the vernacular of of, of these fetish finish objects. But he also, as you or as you know, made paintings and 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 did these 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 completely unrelated works, which are all part of um, his overall oeuvre. Um, but the but but the planks were the thing that 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 he couldn't let go of. Your interview with him was in a, a lovely book where there was a sort of facsimile essentially of his sketchbooks and that's where you really get an access into the sort of mind of John McCracken isn't it because he he wrote a lot in them and also sketched and everything else so so tell me about that interview that you did with him and about that book because it really one really feels that that it sort of animated his mind and animated these sculptures that we that we see in in the galleries which are sort of quite mute in comparison with those sketchbooks right yeah, I mean, uh, the, the interview was 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 actually, you know, not too shortly before his death, it, but it was it was, and it was the only time that I ever spoke to him, and and it was really wonderful. He was walking around. I think he was he was drinking some whiskey, and there was a clinking of ice in the in the glass. So, what, what what's wonderful about the sketchbooks is is that there's so much information in there, um, and 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 when when. When you look at the planks and you, you look at these these other works, you know all, all the information has been kind of um, condensed into these into these amazing amazing surfaces. But 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 the descriptive process that precedes them um, and speculative process was 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 really amazing. Um, there was something very particular about the transition between between this 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 kind of hyperactive. Mindset that went behind them, and then and then this 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 physical activity that he also talked about of 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 of, of making these surfaces. Yeah, and uh, the 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 works that he did make in stainless steel, which most resemble the monolith. You know, he he clearly felt that they were a kind of in 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 some ways, even though yes, that he's then he's not so involved in the making of those. Those those are the most industrially produced objects that he made. But it seems to me that. He definitely felt that in the outside world, these stainless steel works did achieve that kind of transportative quality that we were talking about earlier on in in almost the most effective way that, that because they because they could be almost completely absorbed into the landscape yeah, I think that's right the the, the sort of levitational side of these of, of all of the objects and 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 you know even even if you look at some of the some of the very dark ones like like the the the, the black planks um you know that they they they're either these sort of you know black holes of, of which suck suck weight in or they or they're completely weightless it's very very unclear but the certainly in the stainless steel pieces do that most effectively um because they literally render themselves transparent through the reflection um and 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 disappear and merge and meld with the environment and then create this very, very strange sort of illusion of an edge, um, you know, an edge of reality. And I think, I think that's indigenous to all of the works. In fact, he was always trying to explore that 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 moment at which um, the perceptual and the real start to have a conversation that disturbs our sense of normality. Neville, thank you so much for talking to us about John McCracken. My pleasure. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. You can subscribe to the art newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so and please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahouska, Amy Dawson and David Clack and David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks to Ivan and Daniel and to Neville and thank you for listening. Join us next week for the last episode of the year when we'll be doing our year in review. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.